I am, yeah, okay, I thought I was going to say Jordan Allen. I'm not Jordan Allen, she was supposed to read today, but I'm going to read our scripture today. So if you guys will stand up with me, um, let's just read together. We're going to be in Romans 16. If you have your Bible, go ahead and open it up there. We're going to hang out there a lot today. If you don't have a Bible, by the way, there's Bibles under most of the chairs in here. If you see one, just grab it and you can have that Bible. That's your Bible. You can take it home with you. Um, Or if you need one, like down the road, just wave at a person, tell them to grab you that Bible. All right, Romans 16, verses 21 through 27. It says this, Timothy, my fellow worker, sends his greetings to you, as do Lucius, Jason, Sosipater, my relatives. I, Tertius, who wrote down this letter, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, whose hospitality I and the whole church here enjoy, sends you his greetings. Erastus, who is the city's director of public works, and our brother Quartus send you their greetings. Now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all nations might believe and obey him. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. All right, you guys have a seat. Let's pray together. God, we do, again, just we want to say thank you. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for all the blessings you bestow on us every day in ways that we see, in ways that we don't. God, but you see all things. You know all things. You are the only wise God, as we just read in Paul's last verse of this letter. The only wise God. The only God who knows everything. The only God who is God at all. The only sovereign. The only Lord. Our only hope. Our only salvation our deepest joy, our greatest love. God, you are all these things to us. I pray today, Lord, that as we look at this last and final chapter of Romans, that you would help us to see in these saints that we get to see this this morning, get to see maybe ourselves in them and, and see that, God, nobody is anonymous to you. Everyone is seen by you. Everyone is known by you and especially your children whom you love. God, let us be encouraged, um, maybe, yes, convicted, drawn towards you in a deeper way, towards repentance, towards faith, towards hope and humility and, and joy in the name of Jesus today. God, we thank you so much for your word. Lift it up before us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, anybody in here, raise your hand if you've ever like desired to be famous. Anybody ever have that desire? Or like maybe you once did? Be honest. Come on. Give me a hand. Anybody? Okay. A couple people. Yeah. Not everybody. It's not for everybody, but some people, right? Some people like the idea. Maybe when we're kids, like we want to be a famous, you know, movie star or athlete or something like that. I don't know. Um, and, and, you know, you probably thought about that from time to time. Some people could care. Like, raise your hand if you don't want anybody to know you exist half the time, right? Yeah, that's a lot of us too. And most people didn't raise their hand because you don't want people to know that you exist. And that's okay. Um, not everybody wants to be famous, but... I would, I would venture to say this, and I, I may be wrong, but I think this is probably true of all of us, the way that God has made us and wired us. Nobody wants to be completely unknown either, right? Nobody wants to be anonymous completely in the sense that you want to know that there's somebody that sees you, right? Somebody that knows you, somebody that knows, not just kind of knows who you are, right? But knows the depths of your heart and your soul, right? Knows what you care about, what you desire, your passions, your dreams, your hopes, your wants, your fears, your insecurities, right? That's the, that's the hard stuff, but that's the real stuff, right? And, and hopefully, and it is my prayer for you that everybody in this room, you have somebody in your life, like an actual human being in your life who does know you that way, um, who, who loves you still, because that's the beauty of it, right? That somebody in this world would see us and know us like that and still love us. And I would actually submit to you that you can't really be loved unless somebody really knows you that way. Like knows you, knows the things about you, sees you. And all of your good and all of your not so good, you know, because we all got that. But here's the truth, y'all. God sees us. God sees us all, every bit of us, every uh, microfiber of our beings. God knows us. He knows us intimately. He knows what we think. He knows what we feel. Scripture tells us in Hebrews that he empathizes even with us in our weakness because Jesus became a man like us. He felt. Jesus cried 
Jesus was afraid at times. Jesus was tempted at times. Never sinned, but was tempted. He felt that. Understands what that means. So he empathizes with us. He sees us. And, and, and just more than that, God sees everything that we do, every little hidden thing, every good thing, every not so good thing, um, every way that we draw near to him, every way that we draw away from him. And in, in our kind of insanity sometimes, don't we try to kind of draw away from God and run from God in moments of life? Thinking as if somehow we could get away from his gaze, get away from his, his sight, and we can't. I mean, he just knows us, and he knows us intimately. And that's a great thing. It's also a little bit of a scary thing at times. But I hope this morning that you would just see that if you are in Christ Jesus, there is no need to be afraid of the fact that God sees you. And I hope you would understand that that's a great thing, that he sees you. He sees all of you. He knows everything about you, and he loves you deeply, and he values you. I believe that this chapter, chapter 16 of Romans, um, was written by Paul for one reason, to let it be known that God does see everyone. I named this message non-anonymous saints, non-anonymous saints, because there's all these saints, these Christians, and saint, by the way, saint is the most common word used in the New Testament for Christian people, saints. Did you know you're saints? I don't know if you know that, but in Christ Jesus, you're a saint. That just means one who is set apart, one who is holy in the sight of God, set apart by him as his own, so you are a saint. And all these saints that Paul mentions here in Romans 16, they're not anonymous. Many of them, we don't really know a lot about them, but God does. And I want you to hear that this morning for yourself. I don't care where you feel like you're at on the, the, the hierarchy, if there is one, of Christianity. The reality is we're all pretty low down there, but um, I don't know how you feel about yourself and what you think about yourself and what you do and how you serve the Lord or where you're at with that. But I want you to hear this. God sees you and he knows you, and he loves you, and he values you. And Paul, as he ends up this letter, he just, he just names a bunch of these saints and kind of ways that they're serving the Lord and, and ministering uh, by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, Paul ended chapter 15 by saying, the God of peace be with you all. The God of peace be with you all. Everyone, right? The God of peace. God gives peace and he gives grace and he gives hope and he gives forgiveness to everyone. And we have mentioned this so many times throughout this series. I hope you have heard time and time again what Paul says in Romans chapter 10, that everyone who calls in the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved, right? Everyone. And that includes you and me. Now, if we call in the name of the Lord Jesus, we are saints. We are in him. We are family together. And God gives peace and grace to all of us right? Um, in Ephesians 6, 9, Paul says there's no partiality with God. Did you know that? No partiality. Again, wherever you feel like you fall on that level of Christianity, whatever that means, there's no partiality with God. God just sees all of us as his children. We are his children. Any of you who are good parents in here, you would, you would understand this, right? That how do you love your kids? You love them all and you love them the same because they're your kids, they're your children. And that really is true. And I believe that's the way God sees us. And then I want you to be encouraged by this this morning. In Matthew 6, Paul, or Jesus, actually three different times in Matthew 6, verse 4, verse 6, and verse 18, he says this, that your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Your father, God, who sees what we do in secret. Again, knowing all things about us. You might not think that anybody knows you or sees you. God sees and God knows. And what he sees you do in secret he will reward you. What he sees you do in secret for his kingdom, for his glory, and for the good of those around you, for the church, he'll reward you. And this is a list of people in, in chapter 16. Paul is just named. So let's just, we're not going to talk about everybody in this chapter, but I do want to highlight a few different folks that Paul names. So let's read verses 1 and 2, chapter 16. He says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, uh, not Phoebe Buffet from Friends, but Phoebe, uh, some sort of Phoebe. Don't know if she had a smelly cat or not. Um, a sister Phoebe, a servant of the church in Centria, I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and to give her any help she may need from you, for she has been a great help to many people, including me. So Phoebe is actually the person given the letter of Romans to take it to Rome. And this is an incredible thing. He, he calls Phoebe a sister. He calls her a servant of the church. He calls her uh, someone who has helped many people, a benefactor, right? She has been someone who has just sort of opened her hands up to the church to serve the church in many different ways. He calls her a faithful woman of God. She's a deacon. The, the Greek word diakonos, it means servant. It means minister. 
That's what she is. Phoebe is a minister of the church of Jesus Christ. And she has become a helper, a supporter of many people, including, Paul says, even himself. That Phoebe has, whatever way she's done this, she's, she's helped him. She does ministry and she helps other people do ministry. And she even gets to carry, like I said, she gets to carry the letter of Romans. What a responsibility, right? That you got to take this, the diamond of the Bible, this letter of Romans. She got to carry this thing and probably read it out to the church at Rome. Many house, she probably went around to house churches and read the entire letter to them. That, that, that responsibility was given. Don't, don't miss this, by the way, to a woman. Any ladies in here? All right, this one's for y'all. Because this is Paul, just like Jesus did, his way of kind of uplifting the value of ladies, of women, in a world where that wasn't happening very much, okay? In a world where ladies were property of their husbands. In a world where ladies were often looked down on or disregarded as kind of secondhand citizens, Paul's going, I'm giving this letter to her. You greet her. You commend her. She's a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and she's working hard. And then he goes down. Let's look at verse 6. He says, greet Mary another lady who worked very hard for you. And then verse 12, greet Tryphena, Tryphosa, those women who work hard in the Lord. Greet my dear friend Persis, another woman who has worked very hard in the Lord. I love that Paul names several women in this chapter to make it very clear. In the economy of God, there is no class system. There is no greater or lesser There's only those who are in the Lord and those who are not in the Lord. There are only those who work hard for the Lord and those who do not. These women, they work hard for the Lord. All right, flip over with me, if you would, a couple books to the book of Galatians. So go past Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, and then Galatians. Look at Galatians chapter 3 with me for just a second. Galatians 3, 26. Same guy, same, same guy who wrote Romans, he wrote Galatians. Paul, he says this in Galatians 3, 26. He says, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither, here you go, neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, this is not Paul's way of saying that there's actually no, you know, physical differences between men and women or whatever. Like, obviously we know that. He's not making that point. He's just saying, really, in general, as we look at the world, there are two types of people, those in Christ and those not in Christ yet. And it's our job to, to share the good news of Jesus and hopefully that all people would come to know Christ. They would call the name of the Lord and they would be saved just as we are. But for us, it's just simply this. Are you in Christ? If you're in Christ, then we are one and we are on equal playing field in the economy of God. And that is good news for every one of us, Jew, Gentile, male, female, slave, free, who Paul's talking to, even Georgia Tech fans, like we're all, we're together. We're one in the Lord, right? In Christ Jesus. Man, it it just the beauty of the gospel and how it evens that for all of us. And Paul, again, so values the role of women in the church that he would give this letter to a woman to go and bring it to the church in Rome. That's not just, that's not a task given to just anybody, right? Uh, Probably a guy would lose it. I don't know. Or he wouldn't be able to find it in the, wouldn't be able to find it in the refrigerator. You know what I'm saying? Like ladies can always find that stuff. Um, You know, we're just better at things like that. So he gives it to Phoebe and she gets to take it to Rome. What a, what a task, man. So I just want to say, listen, work hard in the Lord. Paul, Paul talked about those ladies and he said about every one of them, they work hard in the Lord. Be that person, men, women, I don't care who you are. Work hard in the Lord. Give everything you got to him. Romans 12, 1 and 2, again, offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Everything I have, God, is yours. That's the way Phoebe apparently lived and Mary and Tryphena and Tryphosa and Persis, all these ladies. Man, they were just giving themselves over to God. Look at uh, 16, 3 through 5. He says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches and the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets at their house. 
Greet my dear friend, Eponidas, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. So let's talk about Priscilla and Aquila. Paul met them in Corinth in Acts chapter 18. And he's probably still in Corinth while he's writing Romans, okay? So if you're reading Acts 18, that's where Paul is as he's writing this letter. He has met Priscilla and Aquila. There's this married couple. They're Jews from Italy who've been kicked out of Italy by Claudius the emperor. So they had to leave and they go to Corinth. Paul meets them there, this married couple, and they become friends with him, right? They're tent makers like Paul was. Paul made tents for a living to make money, and they did that too. So he kind of connected with them. And then we just see these, the, this couple a couple of different times that they're kind of, they become missionary partners with Paul. And they're the ones who even discipled this guy named Apollos. If you read 1 Corinthians, you'll, you'll read about Apollos, and you'll read about Apollos in the book of Acts as well. Apollos becomes a Christian and becomes one of the greatest preachers in the whole world. A guy who like takes the gospel, just like Paul and the apostles takes the gospel into the world. And he's just such a powerful orator of the gospel. He was that guy. But it was Priscilla and Aquila who brought him along and helped him to know Jesus better. Guys, I, I, let me just say that married couples in here. You know what the church needs? It needs missionary marriages. That's what the church needs. Married couples, married people who are on mission together with Jesus. Right? And that's not to say, by the way, singles, if you're single, that you're not a missionary. I think singles often do this better because single people feel the freedom to do that. But it's married couples sometimes who kind of get married and you just kind of get focused on just that and just your house and just your thing and just your stuff, just your family. But man, Priscilla and Aquila were like, you know what? Yeah, we're married, but we're going to use our marriage not to just huddle in, but to launch out and do ministry together. If you're a married couple in here, I'm just encouraging you, be a missionary couple, be a missionary marriage. Use the opportunities that you had. It said that they had a house church in their home. They were opening up their home to the church. Say, man, y'all come on in. Let's talk about Jesus. They were discipling people like Apollos, bringing a young guy in to help him know Jesus better so that he could then go and be a great preacher of the gospel. The world needs these kind of missionary marriages. There are, by the way, a lot of these marriages in this church. I can name many of them, and some of y'all are in here right now that I just think about as couples in the Lord who are like, man, we are doing this together. We are connected to Jesus, walking together with him, and using what we have and who we are and our relationship and our, our opportunities to go and to serve Jesus in the kingdom. So be that. And the Lord who sees what is done in secret, right? The way Jesus said that, he will reward you. He sees everything that we do and he knows. Look at 5b again, of the second half of verse five. It says, greet my dear friend Eponidas, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. First convert to Christ in the province of Asia. Now, anybody in here willing to admit like you were the first uh, Christian, maybe in your family or like in your sphere of influence, right? would you raise your hand? Like first Christian kind of in your little world. Okay, cool, a couple people. That's awesome. Listen, I just, this is simple, but... I think Eponidas is a great example of, man, just be encouraged. If you're in a place right now, maybe it's your job, maybe it's your family, um, maybe it's your school, where you're sort of the only one following Jesus. Because I know that can feel lonely. I know that can feel really hard. But Eponidas was the first one in the whole province of Asia. That's Turkey. That's Asia Minor, um, but it's Turkey today. Um, and that included the churches that really most, uh, not most, but a lot of the letters of the New Testament ended up being written to, like Ephesians and Colossians and First Peter and Revelation. They were written to those churches because it ended up being this area where the gospel just exploded and churches were popping up all over the place at that time. But Eponidas was the first one. It was just him at first. So if that's you, if you're in a place right now where you just feel like, man, I'm kind of the only one, just be encouraged. That's all I want to say. Just be encouraged that, man, God, you're the, you're the first fruits of what God's doing. And he's going to bring more. He's going to bring a harvest out of that. If you would just be faithful, if you would just keep following him, just keep trusting him right there at your job, at your family, just keep praying, keep sharing the good news with those people around you in your sphere of influence and trust that, man, you're not going to be the only one forever. There's going to be more, and God's going to bring them. Look at verse 10. He says, greet Apelles, tested and approved in Christ. That the Greek of that, the way Paul actually wrote it, could just say this, greet Apelles, the approved in Christ. Wouldn't you like that written on your tombstone? The approved in Christ. The one approved. You know what that word is? That word is about... Um, somebody who has gone through a test 
and has come out having passed the test, approved, right? That, that's, that's what the idea is. Look, look, flip over, if you would, back towards the end of your New Testament, First Peter. Look at First Peter. Or just make a note of this, because I want us to see what Peter says about this very thing, about just testing, right? Being tested and approved um, in Christ. First Peter 1, starting in verse 6, it says, In this, he's talking about, he's talking about uh, um, sufferings, right? In this suffering, you greatly rejoice, we rejoice through our sufferings. We rejoice through our pain. We rejoice through our testing, right? He says, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief of all kinds of trials. Those, these have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. You see that word where Peter says, so that your faith may be proved, approved. That's the same word that he was talking about, appellus, approved, tested and approved. That your faith may be proved through what? What's, what's Peter talking about? Through testing, through trial. He's talking about suffering, difficulty. Appellus apparently had been through something. He didn't say, Paul didn't mention what it was. We don't know what Appellus went through. It could have been any number of things, but he's been through something. And he's been approved. He's come through that thing, tested and approved by God through that testing. And Peter's talking about that's our faith. Like our faith is the thing that God's testing. Our faith is the thing that God wants to approve. That God wants to let you know that your faith is real. Did you know this about God? Did you know he loves you so much that he'll put you through a thing so that you can know on the other side of that thing that your faith wasn't just make-believe? Because that's good to know, is it not? You ever wonder if your faith is real? You ever struggle with, man, is my faith really genuine? Is it really strong? Is it really good? The answer to that question is, God's going to put you through a thing, and you're going to come on the other side of it going, it's real. I still trust you, God. I still have faith in you. I still have joy in you. I still have hope in you going through the thing, because God's that good to us. He puts us through suffering. He loves us so much that he'll test us to approve us in Christ. So I want to pause here just for a minute. Um, and look, we're, we're just kind of being the church today. Is that okay? Because Paul's talking to the church. He's talking to the saints. We're the saints in Christ Jesus. Um, so I'm going to ask for an honest moment from us as a church, okay? Safe place, honest moment. You don't have to tell anybody what your thing is, but I would just ask if you feel like right now in your life, you're going through a thing. You're going through something that feels very much like a test or a trial. Would you just put your hand up? Like you're just going through a thing. Okay. Here's, here's what I want to do. I just want to pause. And everybody saw who put their hands up. And maybe you didn't put your hand up, and that's you too, and that's okay. I just want to take a minute to pray as a church for all of us to pray. Um, pray for those who just raised a hand. If you saw somebody raise a hand, just pray for those who just raised a hand. And if you didn't see, just pray for us as a church, maybe even for yourself, that as we go through the test, that as they go through the test, that they would come to the other side approved in their faith. Let's pray. Let's take a minute. Let's pray. God, I know there's many tests in this room right now. And Lord, I just pray that you would approve these saints in their faith. And they're, 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 some of their suffering may be self-inflicted. Maybe it's something they've done, but maybe not. Maybe it's just something that's happened to them. Whatever the case, God, you know. And in any case, I pray that you would bring them through these trials with stronger faith, faith approved, faith tested, faith that's genuine and stronger than it was before. Test us, Lord, and approve us in Christ Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. Look at verse six, uh, sorry, 13. Look at verse 13. He says, greet Rufus, 
chosen in the Lord. Another good tombstone title, maybe. Chosen in the Lord and his mother, who has been a mother to me too. Rufus, um, we, we, we don't know for sure, but Mark 15, 21 tells us that Rufus and his brother Alexander are the sons of Simon of Cyrene. And if you know who Simon of Cyrene was, he was the man who carried the cross of Christ. That this man that Paul's naming here was the son of the man who carried Jesus' cross up the hill. No mention of Simon here. Simon's probably passed by this time. But it says that Rufus and his mother, like Paul names his mother, so the wife of the man who carried the cross of Jesus. And you got to just put yourself in Paul's mind and situation here for a second. Paul was a Pharisee when Jesus was crucified. He was an enemy of Jesus. It doesn't mention Paul in the Gospels. uh, Paul and Jesus were actually about the same age, born right around the same time. They were contemporaries. Paul's never mentioned in the Gospels, but certainly he knew of Jesus. If he wasn't around, he at least probably knew about him. And he was certainly of the, the, the sect of people who gave approval to his crucifixion. That would have been Paul. Paul was one of those guys who wanted Jesus dead, who put him on the cross. And the man who carried his cross up the hill at the orders of men like Paul, certainly became a Christian, I would imagine, through that experience and getting to know Jesus and then hearing the gospel. And then his wife becomes a Christian and his child, Rufus, becomes a Christian. And then now, many years later, Paul sees that son of the man who carried Jesus's cross as his brother, a chosen man in the Lord, and the wife of the man who carried Jesus's cross as his own mother. Y'all, I was in Starbucks in Madison writing this message. I started crying in Starbucks in Madison, thinking about that. In Starbucks. (laughs) Like, I'm just sitting there crying, just thinking about how beautiful the gospel is. That it changes stories. You know what I'm saying? Like, it changes people's lives. It changes people's stories. The gospel changes people from being enemies to being friends from being strangers to being neighbors, from being adversaries to being family, even mothers and sons who used to be enemies. That's what the gospel does to us. Has the gospel done that for you? Has it changed you that way? It has changed Paul. Paul is a testimony to that. Rufus and his mother are a testimony to that, that they would then embrace a man who approved of the death of Jesus Christ that made their husband, their father, carry the cross up the hill for him, caused so much suffering and death and pain to the Christians for many years. And now Paul, a Christian himself, is embraced by those who had suffered under his hand. And he even calls her mom. Listen, how how beautiful it is that the gospel changes us that way and gives us all an opportunity to be that for each other. You know, there's people in here who don't have family following Jesus. We can be that for each other. You know, there's people in here who don't have moms and dads, or at least maybe not moms and dads that follow Jesus, and, and maybe they're disconnected in whatever way. We can be that for each other. Sons and brothers and sisters, And if nothing else, friends, following Christ together. Y'all, we need this. This is what the gospel does to us, y'all. It doesn't just happen in a vacuum. It literally changes people's stories. It changes people's lives. And then let's look at verse um, 22 and 23 here. I'm skipping ahead some. I, Tertius, who wrote down this letter, greet you in the Lord. I don't know if he had permission from Paul to write that or maybe he just snuck it in, but um, it was Tertius who was actually writing the whole letter. Paul was dictating to him and Tertius wrote it down. So Tertius greets you in the Lord, just using a gift, right? He might've been a good writer, good with dictation or good with, you know, good with words, good with spelling or whatever. Maybe Paul wasn't great at that stuff. I don't know, but Tertius used his gift to, to write down this letter for us. He says, Gaius, whose hospitality I and the whole church here enjoy, sends you his greetings. And Erastus, who is the city's director of public works, and our brother Quartus, sends you their greetings. So Paul just names a few people here who are just using their position in the society that they live in. And Corinth is where they were to serve the church and and build the kingdom. 
So I just want to ask all of us, listen, wherever you are, and that maybe you're somebody out in town here. I don't know who you are. <laughs> maybe you are somebody. Maybe you feel like you're a nobody. But whatever you are and wherever you are, you have some sort of sphere of influence where there are people around you that know you and that you have influence towards, whether it's just your family or friends that you have or peers that you have or coworkers or uh, employees that serve under you, or maybe you are a public figure in some way, use whatever position God has given you for his glory. Use it. Embrace it. Embrace where you are. You know you're not where you are on accident. Do you know this? God doesn't put people in the families that they have by accident. God doesn't put you at your job by accident. God doesn't put you in Covington, Georgia, Mansfield, Social Circle, Jasper County, wherever you're at. God doesn't put you there on accident. You're there by the hand and the sovereignty of God to be where you are, to serve him, to serve the church, to bring glory to Jesus. And if you weren't there, then you wouldn't be there. You get what I'm saying? If you weren't there, nobody would be there to say what you can say, to do what you can do, to serve how you can serve the church and serve Christ and bring glory to him. That's what these people were doing. And so Paul writes this whole letter, this whole chapter, this whole ending of the book of Romans simply to say this, that these are faithful men and women of God. They're servants, they're missionaries, they're co-laborers, they're spirit-filled disciples living out the gospel's call on their lives. You know why Paul included these people in this chapter? You know why? Because they're not Paul. That's why he included them. Because Paul is not the church. You get that? The pastors or the famous Christians that you know about, the missionaries, the writers of scripture, the apostles, they're not the whole church. The church is us. The church is we. The church is all the saints in Christ Jesus, those who have come to faith in him, who have been now filled with his Holy Spirit to go and to do the work of the ministry that God's called us to do. That's the church. It's every one of us. And Paul ends this letter, this amazing letter, this way to remind us of that. That we all, no matter who you are, where you are, we serve one master, one Lord, one God, by one Holy Spirit that lives in us, who has saved each one of us by one Savior, Jesus Christ. That's true of Paul, yes, but that's also true of me, and it's true of you. And guys, we have a job to do in this world, and it's to be available to the Lord, to be used by him wherever we are, whatever we're doing whatever gifts, skills, talents, abilities, opportunities we have to go and spread the name and the fame of Jesus Christ, to share the gospel and to serve people and love people right where we are, right where they are. So Paul ends the letter this way. Now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all nations might believe in him and obey him. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. So he says we are established. He, he says all of us, y'all. Church, we are established by the gospel. Paul said, my gospel. He's talking about the gospel that God gave to him when he became a Christian. Um, God kind of gave Paul this specific thing to teach the churches about being justified in Jesus, being made right with God through the blood of Jesus Christ, being baptized into his name. All the things that Paul has talked about in Romans 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, like all that stuff. That was Paul's gospel that he lifted up for the church. And he's saying that establishes us. We all are rooted in Christ Jesus. He's our foundation. He's our rock, the bedrock that we stand on. And we don't move from him as different as we all may be, as different as, as all the places that we're going to go today and the rest of this week, as different as the stories are that we all could bring in here and talk about of our lives and what's going on and where we're going and what we're doing and things that are happening and circumstances that we're going through and trials that we're facing. As different as all those things are, Jesus is the same for all of us. We are rooted and established on him. He's our savior. And we look to him. That's why every Sunday we come in here and we don't pick a name to sing to. We sing to Jesus. It's always going to be Jesus. It's never not going to be Jesus. We're established in him, rooted in him. And let us never, ever forget that. And church, I would remind us of this, back to the very first chapter of Romans, where Paul says, let us not be ashamed of the gospel. 
for it is the power of salvation to everyone who believes. Let us never be ashamed of that gospel of Jesus Christ that roots us and sets us secure firm on the foundation of his blood and his mercy and his grace to us every single day. And he binds us together in unity as his church. And you are seen by him, you are known by him, valued by him, loved by him, and yes, called and commissioned by him to then go. If you think that this week the kingdom is going to be built just by a select hand-picked few Christians in this world, then you are sadly mistaken. The kingdom is going to be built by us going, who are established in Jesus Christ and launching off of that rock every single week to go and share that good news and then come back in here and celebrate it next Sunday. That's how the kingdom is going to be built every single time. So I just want to end it with this admonition to us. Exactly what Paul says, to the only wise God, the only wise God, be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much that you are good and kind to us, Lord. You are merciful and you are faithful to us, God. You love us. You see us. You know us, God. Right here in this moment, Lord, I just want to pause to let all of us in this room, God, just let us think for a second. Let us think about our own lives. Let us think about the people around us who don't know you. God, I pray that you would bring to mind right now in each one of us, somebody in our lives that doesn't know you. And God, let us be willing to live our lives in such a way with open hands open hearts with joy in the Lord and with the gospel in our mouths. God, that we would be willing to go and to speak and to share the good news of Christ in all that we do. Lord, lead us that way. So give us that name. Give us that person and show us how we might share the good news of Christ with them. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for Romans. Thank you for this beautiful book, this letter that was written, and all these saints that are mentioned in this chapter and all the ones we didn't even talk about, God. Thank you that you let us see today that your church is beautiful because it's so eclectic, so diverse, so different from anything else in the world. And we are that church. 2,000 years later, we're still these people, still the saints, still your church. So send us out today and this week to go and to bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Um, hey, a couple things before you go. Um, just want to mention real quick. So right here on the stage, there are some pamphlet, little Romans Road pamphlets. Anybody know what the Romans Road is? Romans Road. Okay. The Romans Road is just a, like six or seven verses through, through the book of Romans that um, kind of just show a person what it means to be saved. Okay. It's helpful for all of us to know it. I think it's just helpful for us to see what that is and what that looks like. It's also really a helpful tool to give to somebody who maybe doesn't know Jesus. Okay. There are like 600 of them on the stage right here. You guys are welcome to come and get a handful, get one if you want it just to have it or get a bunch if you want to even hand out. Okay. Those are for y'all. We want you to have that as a tool and a resource. We also have the After Church podcast. You go watch that today. It'll be posted on YouTube and uh, Apple Podcasts and all that stuff, where we dive a little bit deeper into these things. Um, and then next week, we're going to jump into our Christmas Advent series. Y'all, it's Christmas time. Merry Christmas, guys. Um, and we'll jump into that next Sunday. So I hope you guys come to that. Listen, bring a friend, bring a family uh, to this Advent series over the next few weeks. Statistics do show that people are a little bit more willing to come to church, okay, this time of year. So just, I don't know, be a little bit bold, be courageous, don't be ashamed, share the gospel with somebody, but invite them to church too, and just maybe, maybe they'll come with you. Never know, all right? Be praying about it. I'll be praying with y'all. And if you do need prayer of any kind or anything from me, I'd love to talk with you right here. I'll be, I'll be hanging out. So love you guys. Y'all have a great Sunday. Thank y'all for being here today.